Hello everyone, my name is Richard Mark Colson Jr. I work at the National Center for Forensic Science, which is a branch operation uh, affiliated through the University of Central Florida. And today I will be talking about fire debris analysis, specifically optimizing laboratory pyrolysis methods to complement real world fire debris. Now let's go ahead and begin. So the purpose of my research was this idea of replicating real world fire debris within the laboratory. And I wanted to do that through controlled heating of flooring substrates. So what I did was I identified different substrate pyrolysis slash combustion products, and I wanted to identify the best technique or the best method of burning and displaying fire debris. And in trying to understand the methodology of the burns, I wanted to represent the casework fire debris through um, principal component analysis, which I'll discuss in a bit. But first, let's talk about fire. So there's four main components of fire. There's oxygen, fuel, heat, and an underlying self-sustaining chain reaction. And a little bit of a misnomer, or kind of a something that's not really clear, the fact that there's a statement that goes around that says that no two fires are alike. That's true, but it's a little bit more than that. It's this idea of the content that it's burning, the burning environment. What is actually burning? And if different additives are applied, then it's going to affect the output at chromatographic profile, or that fire profile for that particular burn. And just to give a little bit of statistics here, for the 1.4 million fires across the United States in 2013, 23% uh, of those fires are still under investigation to the state. And uh, the reason for that is because it's becoming more and more complex and harder to understand uh, for the analysts. There's a lot of difficulties that come into play that um, truly make it difficult to understand kind of the path of the fire and the fire scene. And that's something that I wanted to briefly talk about here today. So the difficulty for the analyst, it comes with this idea of this variability of the fire. There's a lot of different scenarios that can happen. Ventilation, if a door or a window opens or closes, it can change the path of the fire. And similar to this picture that I have here, where we have our puzzle, and the puzzle keeps expanding, the nature of the fire, how it starts, the background interference, these additives that I talked about, it's all going to impact your overall fire scene scenario. And it's becoming more and more difficult for analysts to be able to analyze and understand um, how different materials are impacting the fire scene. So just talking about what's at the fire scene, that's your fire debris. So these pyrolysis um, products that are coming off, these pyrolysis and combustion products are formed through pyrolysis, and that occurs when a material decomposes by heat alone, and it's happening without oxygen. If there's an ignitable liquid residue uh, that is present, then it's possible that it might be detected. So in other words, if ignitable liquid is applied to a material, it's possible that that residue could be detected uh, during the analysis process. And the composition of the substrate is ultimately going to dictate your output at chromatographic profile, as I've stated so far. For different materials that I looked at, I looked at eight different flooring substrates. I looked at carpeting, uh, polyester, nylon, olefin, and carpet padding, wood, yellow pine, and plywood, and my sort of other category, which is similar to wood, but it's a little bit different. It's vinyl flooring and laminate flooring. And I also looked at this combination of polyester carpet and carpet padding. And this is more similar to what you would see in an actual structure. And that's why I thought it would be very important to look at the difference between carpeting by itself and with the padding as well. So for the carpet, uh, I've uh, gone ahead and for all the different flooring substrates, I've listed the different polymers and additional information that kind of comes along with each of these substrates. For polyester, polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, is the polymer that's utilized in the manufacturing process, and it's the most common monofiber carpeting that you're going to find to this day. For olefin, uh, it's made using polypropylene, and it's cheaper than both the nylon and the polyester carpeting. And for the nylon, the polymer that could potentially be used, it's either going to be nylon 6 or nylon 6-6. And uh, depending on which uh, polymer was used in the manufacturing process, your output at chromatographic profile should have either caprolactam or cyclopentanone or different bri uh, byproducts that are coming off of these um, different polymers that were used in this manufacturing process. And it, gives a, it acts as sort of an indicator for what you're looking at and which particular polymer was used in the manufacturing process. For the carpet padding, it's a little bit different. So it's more of a foam, and this is what sits underneath of that carpet layer. Um, it's the polymer that is utilized in the manufacturing process is polyurethane, and there is a natural fire retardant that is applied to the material. It's called TCPP, or tris one chloral 2 probyl phosphate and that's very important because this is considered to be an additive that's applied to that material, and then that's going to impact your output at chromatographic profile. For the carpet structure, 
Here I'm showing a diagram of carpeting, and we have what's known as the face of the carpet, and that's actually going to peel back. It acts as sort of an insulator, and as that peels back, you get to this backing. Now, the backing is made of either polyethylene or polybutadiene, and that's the majority of uh, your product that you're going to see because that's what's going to be burning. So once that insulator peels back, this is the good stuff. This is what you're going to be seeing within your output at chromatographic profile to give you an indication of, okay, this could possibly be a carpet looking at what you're looking at in particular. Uh, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about wood. So uh, I looked at yellow pine and plywood, and for the main components of the wood themselves, it's composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. It's, made, it's composed of 50% cellulose and 25% of both hemicellulose and lignin. The fire retardant that is utilized is uh, a phosphorus-based fire retardant. The yellow pine is more of a natural wood. This is something that you would find. It might have a finish that's been applied to it, but for the most part, it's just the wood. While plywood, it's more of a man-made, manufactured material, and it has these additives, these adhesives, and these fillers. And I wanted to just bring up this, uh, these wood decomposition temperatures, and it's sort of a ramping style uh, pyrolysis that's occurring to where the hemicellulose, which is in the cell wall of the plant, will be burning first, and then the cellulose will be burning next, and then finally that lignin. And it's um, based on the strength of those different materials to where the hemicellulose will uh, sort of decompose first, followed by the cellulose, and then the lignin. For the wood structure, for the plywood, here I have a diagram of plywood. I wanted to show this manufactured, this man-made material. There is the face veneer, which is your wood layer, but then there's particle board that's in between the two face, or your face and then the, um, the back end of the wood to where it's kind of smushed, uh, similar to a sandwich, and you have these uh, different materials that are going to impact your output or chromatographic profile. For other flooring, I have... Uh, vinyl flooring and laminate flooring that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, for the vinyl flooring, it's um, manufactured using polyvinyl cl uh, chloride or PVC, plasticizers and resin, and a, an additive that's been added to the material is TXIB, 224-trimethyl-1,3-pentadiol diisopeterate. And I've referred to this as an additive and not necessarily a fire retardant because it's something that is applied to the material that allows it to be uh, dried, and once it's dried, then different fire retardant materials can be applied to it. So it's sort of a fire retardant additive in itself because it allows for other fire retardants to be applied. And there's additional adhesives that are going to be present in the material as well. Uh, for laminate, it, the uh, manufacturing process utilizes polymelamine coformaldehyde, and the melamine is going to be your fire retardant. There's no sort of adhesives that are present because for the laminate, they're similar to Legos or building blocks to where they're actually be um, sort of pieced together, and then as you lay out the floor, uh, there's no glues that are going to be going because the, the bevels and the uh, edges will be connected to each other, and they will be able to sit um, for that final product for the floor itself. Now, what's interesting about both vinyl and laminate, before I move on, um, there's actually a sort of air pocket that will be sitting between the floor layer and um, kind of the underlying... Uh, base to your structure. So there is a scenario where fire can actually persist underneath and that's very important to realize that there's a potential for fire to happen um, from below and then thinking about how that could potentially affect your output at chromatographic profile is important. And just real quick I wanted to just go over a diagram of laminate flooring that I have here. There's a wear layer, a print layer, your core layer, and a backing layer. So your core layer is going to be kind of similar to particle board to where it's kind of flimsy uh, the majority of what you're going to see is this wear and print layer. The wear layer is um, sort of this uh, additive, this um, something that is present to the material that realistically is once again going to impact your cr output at chromatographic profile. For my method development, I wanted to go off of something that um, Dehan talked about initially. He said that full-scale duplication of fire scene is near impossible in the laboratory. And that's very important, so how would I go about working with that? How would I go around this sort of quote? I wanted to analyze the substrates individually within the laboratory and then um, kind of piece everything together from there. So in order to do that, I wanted to assess or kind of analyze my laboratory burns using principal component analysis, my PCA models of two different data sets, large-scale burns and substrate slash ignitable liquid data sets. And I'll be talking about those data sets um, to come here shortly. And I burned eight different substrates with four different burning methods for three increasing burn times. So here's these burn methods. And for the method in progress, I've shown a picture here to kind of display these different burn methods and how I went about doing it. 
for the modified destructive distillation method or the MDDM, this allowed for the most product that would be seen and retained within this container because it's being uh, it's occurring within the container and it has a paint can lid uh, over top of it and uh, that is um, secured during the burn and then it's replaced with a new lid that has no punctured holes in it and in my additional notes that I have here I have a lid that's punctured with nine millimeter holes and it's very important because it allows you to see the smoke so once your burn time is complete a new paint can lid is allowed to be placed over um, this paint can that I have here and then it's allowed to sit and cool and it goes through that extraction and the analysis process as I'll talk about for the top heat and the bottom heat method, it's a little bit different. It's not done within a container. I did them within a uh, tin boat, and it's on a pan, and it's being heated from either above or below, and I was very particular about what side was being burned. So I always made sure that the same side was being burned, this top layer. And um, for these particular burns, as I said, the flame is either directly being applied to the material on the top heat, or for the bottom heat, it's heating through two separate layers. So it's kind of this difference, how does the flame um, affect if it's going directly on it, or if it's being um, sort of applied through multiple layers, and how would that affect it? Uh, then finally, I looked at the tube furnace method, which is something similar to what uh, Dr. Mark Sandercock did. And he did it uh, in a sort of larger tube furnace, so I tried to scale it down for my purposes. He did it for a longer period of time. Um, so I looked at two minutes, five minutes, and 10 minutes, which was different than my initial burn times that I used for my other burning methods. And since this is being done within a container, I tried to sort of do it similar to the modified destructive distillation method or my MDDM method. So I created a faux or a fake lid and that was done using aluminum foil, and then I took a paper clip and I poked holes in it. There's nine millimeter, or well, or my nine holes that I poked into this, and then um, once the process was completed, I ended up stopping it with a stopper, um, so that way it was able to kind of um, contain everything within this container. And then um, once I was able to uh, go from there, I was able to screw a lid on uh, and then place it into the oven for the extraction process. So for that extraction process, I utilized the ASTM E1412 uh, method, and I did it using an activated charcoal strip, which was placed into a vial of 500 microliters of carbon disulfide. And for the analysis process, I utilized the ASTM E1618 method, and that allowed me to uh, do an evaluation of the peak patterns and sort of identify and classify the different components that sort of come along with the process. And I showed for the extraction process a diagram that I have here. The oven was set at 66 degrees Celsius, and um, it was allowed to sit for 16 to 18 hours. Then it was placed out of the oven. It was um, uh, the activated charcoal strip was placed into a vial that contained CS2, and then I was able to analyze it on the GCMS instrumentation. So for my data sets that I ended up using, uh, going back to this now, and going to this idea of PCA, I looked at two different data sets. Large scale burns, which was done previously in 2012. Large shipping Konex containers were burned that had a lot of different materials, a lot of different um, Walmart, Ikea furniture, different things that were placed, and it was supposed to be similar to a structure. It was burned, and then different ignitable liquids were applied to the material. Now, um, once that debris was collected, it was analyzed and compiled into this data set. And that is different than the neat ignitable liquid slash substrate uh, data set, which is composed of 445 pure ignitable liquid samples that have been analyzed using GCMS instrumentation and 122 substrate samples that were burned only using the MDDM method, as I've described it previously, but only at two minutes. And that's where this difference comes into play. And what I wanted to look at was how these different data sets were similar to the burns that I did. And to make sure and kind of uh, and test these different data sets and these uh, principal component analysis spaces, I wanted to utilize another data set. So I utilized an in silico data set, was, which was a mixture of total ion spectra data of ignitable liquid and substrate um, that was collected and um, computer generated to where it was creating a, a ton of mixtures and it was over 6,000 mixtures that were being compared and looked at and then sort of comparing that for a testing model to see how my um, graphical interpretation does in um, making sure that this data is similar to it and I'll be showing that here today. But first let's talk about a little bit about principal component analysis. So principal component analysis in itself, it's utilizing a score matrix as a way of sort of reducing the dimensionality of the data. You're reducing the number of variables that you're looking at. 
And what I wanted to do is I wanted to overlay a contour region that outlined the areas where specific samples would project. So as we can see here for the PCA space of the need ignitable liquid slash subspace, we have our substrate region, and then we have our um, naphthenic paraffinic, petroleum distillate, miscellaneous oxygenates, gasolines, aromatics, um, normal alkanes, and isoparaffinics. And they are all sitting in this sort of ignitable liquid um, layer if we want to call it that, or this region that's sitting below, and it's in this coral red or this pink um, that is being shown here. Now, this is going to be used for the modeling of my fire debris through this projection of the scores from the burn data that I completed. So here are the three, or the first three principal component, um, principal component spaces that are being shown. And these are three different orthogonal views. So what I'm using is the first three principal components, that are covering uh, a certain variance in the data, and then I'm projecting my data within this to see how they kind of compare. And what it allows for is it allows me to utilize the total ion spectra data to be able to make these comparisons, see how closely they interact, and um, see if there's any overlap, and then that overlap is going to show me uh, where there's similarities in the data, where these ions are um, similar and consistent. And then that um, goes forth and kind of shows here's where the similarities lie. And then I'm going to be using the ticks to be able to show where the differences lie. And I wanted to do it on both the large scale burns and the neat IL slash subspaces to see how they sort of differ, uh, how they're similar, and how that comes into play. So for the projection of the pure ignitable liquid slash sub data into the LSB PCA space, here I have the ignitable liquid data and I have substrate data. And this is pure data that's being projected in here. So for the first two principal component spaces and the space that's being shown, we're seeing a lot of overlap. And we're seeing a scenario to where the substrates could sort of be similar. Um, they're sort of going in one direction while the ignitable liquids are going in another direction, but there is a lot of mixing that's happening. There's a lot of confusion, but if we're looking at the PC1 versus 3 or PC2 versus 3, we're starting to see more of a separation of the ignitable liquid and the substrate, with the ignitable liquid being on the bottom and the substrate sort of persisting near the top. And that's something that was similar to the need IL slash sub PCA space that was shown previously today. Now for the projection of the in silico data and sort of this test model as I was talking about before, we have our ignitable liquid and we have our substrate. And for the in silico data that's being shown here, uh, if it is considered to be ignitable liquid, then it had um, at least 1% ignitable liquid. If it was substrate, then that means that it had 0% ignitable liquid. And that's very important as we continue to talk about this. But um, what I wanted to point out here was that we can see this difference between the ignitable liquid and the substrate and where they're sort of projecting within this, of these first two principal component spaces. But for the neat IL slash sub PCA space in this in silico data, what you're seeing is for the ignitable liquid, you're seeing that there's a difference between um, the points that have a lot of ignitable liquid, which are sitting near this ignitable liquid region on the bottom of our PCA space that's being shown, and the substrate region to where anything that is, has the substrate percentage and a large substrate percentage is sitting within the substrate region. And anything that has um, ignitable liquid, for the ignitable liquid projection that we're seeing here, uh, anything that is considered to be in the substrate region or projecting within that substrate region and above, it has a small or low amount of ignitable liquid percentage, but it has at least 1%, and that's why it's been labeled as such. So um, now that I've kind of shown this test model data, let's go ahead and move into the results. And for the results, I, for my laboratory burn results, I completed it using the four different burning methods, as I said, to do 108 total burns. I obtained ticks and uh, tonal ion spectra, and I um, identified the products that were within the ticks as well. For my data set that I was using for my burn data and the scores, it would spin normalized using the sum to one method with the baseline being removed, and those baseline ions were 32 and 76. Now this data is going to be projected, and I will be showing that, or at least some examples of it. Um, due to time constraints, I can't show everything that I did, but it's the projection of this laboratory burn points into these two different PCA spaces and then sort of comparing it to the utilized data sets that were um, being used here today. So here's the large scale burn PCA space of the polyester carpet burns. And what we're seeing is there's uh, a lot of overlap between the bottom heat and the top heat um, through these three orthogonal views that are being shown. And for the furnace and the MDDM, we're seeing a little bit more separation. We're seeing that the furnace is sort of moving towards that bottom heat and the top heat. But as we sort of um, contort and look at different views, we're seeing that um, everything is still consistent within those three views, but that the MDDM is 
sort of by itself. It's clustering towards itself, and we're seeing a little bit of a difference between that and the furnace. Now, I wanted to point out that for the other large-scale burn PCA spaces, everything projected within this region, and it's showing a similarity in the data. But just in and of itself, what I'm showing here, this is showing that there is similarity in the ions that are being used, these total ion spectres. You're breaking it down. You're seeing what you have. We're seeing that similarity, and we're seeing the comparison of the data, and that's why it's overlapping. And that's why it's very interesting to be able to look and make a graphical interpretation of what you're looking at. And that's why it's very interesting to be able to utilize something like PCA to be able to understand um, fire debris analysis just in general and taking this burn data. So now I wanted to look at the need IL slash sub PCA space and this is a little bit different because now we're projecting it onto a region to where um, the contour regions have been um, kind of understood and it's been overlaid so that it's you're seeing what similar uh, components or what similar compounds, uh, what similar ignitable liquids or similar substrates, where they were coming out at, and then how that compares to my burns. So it's kind of taking it a step further. And it's really interesting to sort of look at here, we're once again seeing that the bottom heat and the top heat are grouping together, they're clustering together. And it sort of seems uh, difficult in the comprehension of what we're looking at, but it's very necessary to start to understand PCA just in general to be able to have a graphical interpretation of it while not necessarily um, going forth and trying to use QDA, LDA, rock curves, which is something that I would want to do in the future, this is sort of a preliminary approach to it. And it's very interesting to be able to take this graphical interpretation approach and sort of see, okay, bottom heat and top heat are gripping together. We know that they have similar ions, perhaps because they're both not done within a container, that's showing that there's similarities within uh, the burning method that's showing that these ions are similar, okay, they're grouping together, and that's very interesting. Furnace and MDDM, we're seeing that the points themselves are shifting with an increase in burn time, and that's something that I forgot to mention. Those arrows, as we're seeing here, it's showing an increase in that burn time. So the first point is going to be your 30 seconds, your next point is going to be the one minute, and your final, uh, your final point will be the two minute burn, uh, except for the furnace, of course, which is two, five, and ten but it's very interesting to see how they cluster together or how they're separating. And here I wanted to just show the ticks. So we saw that the top heat and the bottom heat are clustering together, but for the ticks themselves, we're seeing that they're very different. We're seeing that there's uh, different components. Um, we're seeing that the resolution is a little bit better in the top heat, where it's you're able to see different components that are able to be identified comparatively to the bottom heat to where there's um, a ton of pyrolysis product in the back end, which I wasn't able to identify. And I just thought that that was very interesting that the top heat and the bottom heat are grouping together. They're showing similarity in the ions that are being observed um, within the tick and uh, within the total ion spectrum, uh, excuse me. But for the tick itself, we're seeing that there is a difference in what we're looking at. And it's very interesting to make that comparison and try to understand what is occurring. For the projection of the plywood burn data into the neat IL slash sub PCA space, so this is just another example, I just wanted to show that there was a difference between the uh, MDDM and the furnace and the bottom heat and the top heat. So here we're seeing that the furnace and the MDDM are clustering more closely together, but then in that final MDDM burn, we're seeing this sort of huge shift away from that cluster of burns. And then once again, the top heat and the bottom heat are staying the same. Finally, I uh, wanted to once again talk about that combination of polyester and padding, how does it sort of differ? But I wanted to take it a step further. What if I went ahead and I implied it, uh, an ignitable liquid to the material, and then I did the burn? How would that affect it? So I went ahead and I used the MDDM method, once again, because it allows for that largest retainment or uh, retaining of the different um, components that could potentially be seen um, within the burn itself, and you're able to make uh, the majority of those identifications using utilizing a burn method like that because it allows for sort of the largest possible uh, scenario for what you could potentially see. That being said, um, most of the time, if not all the time, it's a little bit too much um, comparatively to what you would actually see in a fire, at least for the MDDM method. And that's why sort of being able to figure out the variance, uh, what burn method works the best, you sort of need a mixture of everything to be able to see what you could potentially see in a natural fire. So here for the polyester and padding lab burn points against this neat IL slash sub PCA space, I wanted to point out that for the ignitable liquid uh, applied um, materials that were burned, they are sitting near their um, kind of respective 
region that you would expect them to go in. So for the MPD, this medium petroleum distillate, it was it ended up projecting near the petroleum distillate point. Then with that increase in burn time, we're seeing the loss of the front of the chromatographic profile, that loss of the volatile materials in the front of the chromatographic profile with an increase in burn time. You're seeing that loss of the sort of um, ignitable liquid residue that was within um, this output of chromatographic profile. And in seeing that, you're seeing this sort of shift away from the ignitable liquid region towards the substrate region. And I just thought that was really, really interesting. And then we're seeing it again for the gasoline to where it's sort of close to the gasoline contour region. And then with that increase in the burn time, we're seeing it shift away towards the substrate region. And I just thought that was really, really interesting, and I wanted to share that here today. Now for the different pyrolysis products that were identified for the carpeting, the wood, and our sort of other laboratory burns, I wanted to point out what the similarities and what the differences were um, before I leave you here today. So for the carpeting, the majority of what was being observed in um, the carpeting burns was styrene, benzaldehyde, and 2,4-dimethyl-1-heptene in particular were all above 50%. And as I can, as I've pointed out here, there weren't necessarily too many oxygenated components. It was a large mixture of different materials and different products that were being identified. But for the majority of the carpets, styrene was being identified, which is very important. Um, because once we start to make these comparisons, you would see that it is different for the other components. And that goes off this idea that the output of chromatographic profile is going to be dictated on whatever was burning and whatever was applied to that burn and it's very very important now for the wood we're seeing a lot of oxygenated components methyl ester hexadecanoic acid 2 ethyl 1 hexanol uh, 2 aldehyde. so uh, what we're seeing is a large majority of oxygenated components for the wood and then as you expect for this other which is similar to the wood for the vinyl and the laminate flooring we're seeing a lot of oxygenated components and it goes off this idea that we're seeing some similarities that are overlapping even between those. So for the um, sort of looking at a Venn diagram of this, for the carpeting and the wood, they share benzene, benzaldehyde, and toluene, but carpeting and others share nothing. For other in wood, they share hexanol, 2-phraldehyde, and 2-methoxyphenol, while both being a large majority of oxygenated components, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of overlap. Now, for all three of them, as we can see, there was no overlap between all three, which I thought was extremely interesting. So going off of this and kind of leaving you here today, for conclusion, there was no one laboratory burn method that was totally representative of fire debris. We saw that the top heat and the bottom heat burns, they clustered, they clustered together, and that was due to similar pyrolysis slash combustion products that were produced, and this idea that they had similar ions, and it was being observed, and that's why they were clustering together. For the chromatographic profiles, um, as I've talked about here today, it's always dependent on the composition of the substrate. What was added to the material that sort of dictates this output at chromatographic profile? Were there additives, uh, adhesives, fillers, glues? Was a fire retardant applied? Was it being burned over here uh, rather than over here? Was it being burned in another state? Did the environment affect it? Was there any ventilation? There's a lot of factors that go into this, but ultimately the chromatographic profile is going to be dictated on the substrate that is being burned. Uh, we saw that there was a similarity between the laboratory burns and the large-scale burns that was visualized by that PCA plot. So all the burns ended up being projected within that region, and then you were able to see the similarities and the differences um, based on those PCA plots. As I said, that graphical interpretation is important. And for the product analysis, it allowed us to see this kind of minimal overlap between different substrate groups. And what we saw was there were some similarities uh, between the wood and the other in terms of those oxygenated components that were being identified. But still, even from there, there were only a few that were overlapping between um, possibly the carpet and the wood or the wood and the other. And that was something that I thought was interesting. Now, in terms of future research, I wanted to kind of refine my LSB PCA data to include an informed analyst ground truth. So in other words, I kind of wanted to structure it similar to the neat IL slash sub PCA spaces, but sort of have these different regions, show where the ignitable liquid is, show where the substrate region is, so that it becomes a little bit more useful in kind of that graphical interpretation at that point. Um, but it was a very good indicator to kind of show that it was similar to this large scale burn data that was burned previously. I want to continue the burning of the different substrates to help increase the burn data and uh, additionally add samples that are found and uh, look at samples that are found within a, uh, the substrate database. And what it's going to allow for is an additional tool for analysts to be able to utilize, and that's very, very important. 
Uh, I want to continue using PCA as a way of modeling fire debris data to observe correlations and differences and perhaps start to think about and use rock curves, QDA, LDA, to be able to sort of maybe look at likelihood ratios and how that could apply to um, different scenarios and looking at fire debris. Uh, when can you say something's ignitable liquid versus um, something that doesn't contain ignitable liquid? And I think that would be very uh, important and distinct to be able to make that distinction and when can you really say, oh, okay, this definitely has an ignitable liquid and I can see that because of X or Y. Uh, and also, I just want to study uh, frequent components that are detected in the substrate and ignitable liquid containing samples. So kind of seeing that overlap and seeing the minimal overlap, but then also seeing some things that are similar um, really made me think about kind of what I'm seeing and uh, where there could possibly be a lot of overlap between substrates that are similar, substrates that are different, different ignitable liquids, and um, just going off of that, just kind of keeping with this idea of does the substrate always dictate that output a chromatographic profile? I believe so. It seems to be the case, uh, but I want to do uh, further research on that to see how that truly impacts what you're looking at. And thank you for watching. Have a nice day.